Sorry. And now it is recording. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, how's everyone doing? Uh, my name is Frank, and I want to welcome you to uh, Reunion Latino Virtual Training Institute, uh, and especially to this session, right, which is uh, our communities, the impact of social determinants of health. Um, quiero recordarles a todos también de que tenemos uh, interpretación en español, así que si es que necesitan escuchar uh, este webinar en español, uh, el servicio de interpretación está disponible en la barra de Zoom, si es que se nos están uniendo por uh, computador, y están en los tres puntitos de More, si es que se nos están uniendo por uh, celular. Ok, uh, so... Um, I think we know that um, within the Hispanic and Latinx communities, there have been people uh, disproportionately impacted uh, by disparities uh, due to gender identity as well as sexual orientation. Um, so today we want to discuss in this session the impacts of social determinants of health on men who have sex with men, as well as transgender and cisgender women. Uh, so to discuss this topic, uh, we have gathered a wonderful uh, panel of uh, wonderful speakers. So uh, I just want to mention them and then let them introduce themselves. Uh, we have with us the executive director of Voces Latinas, Natalie Rubio Toro. Hi, Natalie, how are you doing? Uh, I also want to welcome uh, Vice President and Chief Operations Officer of the Trans Latina Coalition, uh, Maria Roman Taylorson. Hi, Maria, how's everything? And I also want to welcome uh, Professor and Director of the Center for Latino Adolescent and Family Health, as well as the Associate Vice Provost for the Center for Faculty Advancement uh, at NYU. Uh, Dr. Vincent Guillamo Ramos. How, uh, hi, Dr. Vincent, how's everything? Uh, so um, first we're going to uh, be starting with Natalie. I think Natalie is going to be guiding us through uh, what determinants of health mean, um, correct? So uh, I want to uh, open it up to Natalie for her to uh, talk to us. Well, thank you so much um, for this uh, opportunity to talk about uh, social determinants of health, which we don't mention enough, I think. I think it was a big, I, I heard it mentioned more maybe uh, pre-COVID and, um, and then stuff happened. So I um, thank you for giving us the opportunity. I think this is a great panel to, to really be inclusive. Um, before I do that, I just wanna introduce, I'm Natalie Rubio Torrio. I'm the executive director of Voces Latinas. And we um, are 17 years old, I can't believe that. But um, we, you know, started originally as a women's agency, and um, led by, you know, Latinas in the immediate community of Western Queens. And through their work, they identified so many other needs, so many other populations, all uh, coming from the same immigrant background, and Latino immigrant background. And so we've expanded and um, included to, you know, everyone that shares that experience of being Latino and arriving to the United States. Um, so we are now serving, we're open to, to everyone, but you know, our roots are still there. So I'm, I'm, when I was asked to talk about uh, cisgender women, um, you know, it's, it's an ongoing kind of topic. Uh, I thought that I would start with a video so that we could kind of set context to the, to the presentation and what is social determinants of health, right? So I'm gonna share and go straight to the video and it's literally a, just a definition, but it's much nicer to hear the video than me to speak. So hold on. Oh, no.
but take a look around you. You're on mute, Natalie. Okay, so thank you. Um, so that was just, I hope everyone, it kind, of, it kind of went fast, but just giving a little bit of a context on what social determinants of health are and how we, you know, what, what else we need to look at when we say health. Um, then I wanna go a little bit deeper. So when we look at health, we just have to also consider everything else that's in this, in this diagram or this image. Uh, for your, you know, for your, for your average person's health. Uh, we have to look at everything that involves, and this is kind of a social work perspective. I'm also a social worker or a social work framework because um, we do look at all of these other things that make up an individual's life and uh, how, it, how they respond to such things. Um, so I just wanted to kind of give this picture because everything around us, everything we do, our, the air we breathe, the people we see, it all influences us from the day we're born, even in the womb, right? But then when you dig a little deeper, when I was asked, what about gender? Gender is not listed under social determinants of health. Yet I think it's something that is definitely a part of our daily lives and how we experience our health and health outcomes. Uh, strong evidence of link between gender and many mental and, and me mental, mental illness is also out there. The course of illness and efficacy of treatment, and then relationships of gender and rela uh, gender and depression also exist. And I just put a little blurb down in the bottom that at Vosis, when we over fifty percent of the women that we assess for depression and trauma come out positive for both. So that's saying a lot. I'm glad that we are, for over the last few years, we've been measuring that because, uh, you know, women are part of a huge part of society, but also part of the raising our children in the next generation. And if we find that at Vosta, so many of us, so many of our clients are walking around with depression and other mental illness without being able to access uh, medication or treatment. And so that's kind of just already a, a look at our the future, right? Of our of who's who's to come next in mm -hmm. our community. So gender is something that we don't really look at. Um, then a little bit more, we 80% of an individual's health is determined by non-clinical factors. That's through Robert Wood Johnson. We're not really looking when we're looking at health, we're not really looking at those non-clinical factors. So gender roles, norms, and behaviors also influence how individuals access health services and how health systems respond to those different needs. And I think this panel knows we're like the experts, we've lived it, we were walking in those shoes and speaking for our clients, right? Mm -hmm. And then lastly, gender inequality leads to health risks for women and girls globally. Addressing gender norms and roles leads to a better understanding of how the social construction of identity and unbalanced power relations between men and women affect risks, health seeking behavior and health outcomes of men and women in different age and social groups. I think this is something so important, especially for us community based agencies that form programs, um, create services to address uh, our, our communities. And, um, and I know that we're, especially nowadays, looking at, at those immediate needs like food, like shelter. Um, and I think that we also, though, have to take a, a closer look mm -hmm. at gender and how this is also affecting our access to that food, to that, to that um, housing, that shelter, mm -hmm. uh, where we say, oh, no, no, you know, these zip codes, we're, we're giving out food, we're giving out um, emergency medical assistance or um, financial assistance. But I think we have to look a little deeper into how people are accessing, right? Depending on gender as well. And so another, another fact, a Healthy People 2020 outlines the pivotal role that sexual and reproductive health plays in elim eliminating health disparities and ensuring the overall health of individuals and communities. And this is in particular more to, um, I'm, you know, representing women, cisgender women. And I say this, I, I present this because I just want us to keep that in the back of our minds while I go through this. And then by the time I end what we're doing actually to address reproductive um, health. You add on immigration, 
So now we have uh, gender and now we have immigration, which again, immigration is not looked at when you, when you talk about social determinants of health. Um, so if you see how an individual comes and migrates to the country, the lifestyle that they lead, okay? Again, we all lived, been there, done that, right? And we see what our clients go through, living conditions. We think about what our clients are, the living conditions that our clients are under, uh, what they qualify for, what they don't qualify for, the overcrowded housing. I mean, Elmhurst, Queens was the uh, crisis, right? How did we get so much, how, how did so many people get COVID so quickly? Me, people live in overcrowded housing. What kind of work we're doing? Um, social and entertainment. And then lastly, what kind of government and policies, what is governance and policies? What are, what's happening? What are we doing to address these, these, um, these issues that so affect our community's health? And then it's just another slide to kind of break it down a little bit, like a little bit clearer. So um, people being an immigrant and then adding the whole gender uh, role, you know, before migration, exposure to war or why, why we even come here, you know, many, many times we don't even ask that question. Why are people migrating here? Um, these are so many different reasons. A lot of it is economic hardship and violence. And during the migration, how much happens, especially women um, are being violated, are being sold, are, you know, so many things are being, are happening that nothing is discussed while here. And then after migration, all the, the you know, the, the poverty, the, the living conditions, um, the isolation, the lack of work, um, all of this takes a toll. And really when we're looking at so, social determinants of health, we are, we need to take a closer look at this. And now I want to kind of look back at this slide that, you know, considering all these other factors that surround a person's health. But then when you add the, the gender and the immigration issue, all of these other things pop up. Okay. And this is all based on our experience with our clients and what they're going through. Um, but again, we don't look at these closely enough when we're talking about social determinants of health. Uh, and I just wanted to highlight, and this is probably not even half of it, but I just wanted to highlight these things and really um, uh, make it a point that we, depending on who you're talking about, uh, how they got, how, how we're getting here in terms of immigration, we have to look at these other social determinants of health, which we rarely see when we're talking, when we're reading about um, the, the literature. So, at Vostis, we can't do you know, all this work alone. So we have to look at our valuable partnerships that address some many of these things while we're addressing what we can address. And I have to always highlight and give props and, and, and a big um, applause to our partnerships that actually come to our site and, um, and, uh, and provide reproductive health care, provide uh, ESTI screenings, um, that provide men more mental, like a higher level of uh, a clinical care for mental health co counseling, uh, legal services. If we don't address and provide these services, then um, our our clients are not. You know, there's there. It's continuing. It's a continuing uh, spiral down for their their health outcomes. And then our, our, our model, our programs and services is if you could see healthcare is in the middle because it goes back and forth, it goes, it, it goes towards everybody, we have to adapt, we have to um, uh, adapt certain services to depending on who's coming in, depending on who the client is, but everybody gets that piece of uh, the, uh, the, the assessment is the healthcare needs. But again, looking at all these other uh, factors that um, people are living in and, um, and addressing them. Uh, and then we, something that VOSIS does is look at those subpopulations that I call of individuals and populations that are actually, and again, I was asked to talk about cisgender, so I'm, 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 I'm going to focus right now on, on cisgender women that we're serving and just imagining what their health outcomes could be right now. Uh, many, many of the, our clients are come from the bar work, come from massage parlor work, come from, you know, restaurant and bartending work. Uh, and so, you know, it's just kind of putting it out there. Where, what, do, what do we think is their health 
factors right now. Um, what are their health outcomes if they're not insured and they're not going to be treated and they're exposing themselves, especially right now during COVID to all these different um, environmental, but also the need for work. Uh, there's not much choice in work uh, in, 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 you know, put knowing sometimes, but not knowing the exploited, the exploitation and that type of uh, situation of work. Um, these are all very, very real factors that we have to look at when we see social determinants of health, when we hear about it, but we don't talk about it. And I have to show this because it's very explicit. It's very, you know, um, attention grabbing. But this is what our women in our immediate Queens community are living through and going through and exposing themselves through. And we need to continue to address it together. Um, because again, this our future, the future of families, future of children really relies on uh, women's health right now, especially right now with what COVID has, um, has caused. So I, I know I'll, I'm not sure how I am with time, but um, that's the end of my slides. And I have, you know, we can discuss more. I could take any questions towards the end, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natalie. I I think uh, I think our panelists as well as the attendees can agree that um, that was a very holistic uh, point of view when it comes to social determinants of health. Uh, and thank you for giving us that um, that specificity at the end when it comes to cis women. Uh, I definitely think that uh, it didn't leave a lot of room for questions because it was so complete. Uh, but I also want to encourage uh, all participants to drop your questions, not only about Natalie's uh, presentation, but a, about the presentations that we are about to have as well. Uh, now I'm going to, to introduce um, uh, Maria Roman, uh, who is going to be giving us, uh, hi, how are you? Uh, so uh, she's going to be giving us, uh, you know, that perspective that comes with uh, transgender women and uh, their social determinants of health. Uh, so I want to welcome you, Maria. Thank you. I think there's nothing else I can add. And Ali said it all. <laughs> it was such a thorough presentation about social determinants of health that I don't want to kind of repeat. Um, I'm going to be talking um, through the lens of HIV. You know, I, I think when we look of, at uh, the trans population in Los Angeles, most, unfortunately, most of the health programming is really related or wrapped around HIV through the HIV lens. Um, so I will be discussing that. I'm going to try to share my screen. Yes. Um, so some of the stuff that I would like to discuss today um, is, um, you know, talk about trans-led work, um, which as a trans woman of color, I think is the the next frontier for trans people to have work that is developed, created, executed by trans people. Um, and also the importance about investing in trans leadership. Um, if we're gonna talk about you know, health and, and, and specific program for trans people, uh, it's imperative that trans people are involved in the process of developing this programming. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about inclusivity when it comes to programming and, you know, touch a little bit about the social determinants of health. I think Natalie was very thorough. And I think there's a lot of inter intersectionalities when you look at um, different communities, whether it's cis women, trans women, um, there's a lot of issues that really, we have intersections that, that, um, that both uh, women are, are dealing with. I think um, something that um, we have to look at is the trans population in the United States. You know, 1.5 million trans people in the US is one of the poorest uh, populations in this country. Um, just in this state, it's estimated that 218 trans people um, I'm obviously in California. Uh, well, not obviously, but I am in California. <laughs> um, and, you know, the rates of homelessness and lack of access to uh, services, you know, where you were born, where you live, what your gender is. Uh, all these things are social determinants of health. And I, I think that as Natalie mentioned, we now begin to really hear this at uh, a national level that when we're talking about health outcomes and health programming, 
people are discussing that. Traditionally, you know, a lot of the interventions that were developed weren't taking those things into account. It was kind of focused on behavior, um, but we're now looking at the whole person and, and that is important. Um, I do wanna talk a little bit about Los Angeles. Um, I am the, I'm fortunate to be the vice president and chief operations for the Trans Latino Coalition, one of the uh, trans -led leading agencies in the country. Um, but there's only few women in my position who are trans that are ahead and spearheading an organization like this. Um, so it is important to take that into account because when it comes to decision making process of how um, we acquire funding, how we develop programming, many times we're not part of those conversations. Uh, and it's critical that as we continue to discuss trans people, we, we take their perspective, we take their journey, we take uh, the challenges that, that people are dealing with. I myself, I'm uh, somebody that comes from dealing with homelessness, uh, sex work as a way to survive, yet, you know, 30 years later, my community continues to face the same challenges that I faced as a young person. But today I'm in a position uh, where I'm, I'm, uh, I have the privilege to be able to lead this organization. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the history, you know, not until uh, 2009 did we start seeing trans-led organization, including the Trans Latina Coalition and many other organizations across the country that are doing trans-led work. Um, we are so behind when it comes to uh, programming. If you take other populations, gay men, cis women, you know, there's a lot of programming that has been developed over the years, yet we're kind of just beginning to really um, develop um, these type of centers that are specifically run by trans people, including Casa Rubi, um, we've had challenges with the CDC ongoingly um, releasing funds specifically for uh, MSM and trans women, which has been problematic over, you know, the last two decades. So as we look at social determinants of health, you know, housing insecurity, like Natalie mentioned, where you were born, where you live, do you have access to fresh produce? Are you able to go to the grocery? Um, are you safe when you leave your house? Um, as a trans woman of color, I know that um, every day I leave my house, you know, I don't know what I'm gonna be facing. And that is the journey for many trans women uh, and trans men. Uh, the fact that we're living in a world that uh, in essence, um, you know, does not accept us and is an ongoing uh, security issue for trans people. We continue to see countless uh, trans people murder every day. All those things really affect an entire community, a person. If I'm not safe where I'm going um, you know, to work, do I have access to healthcare? Um, depending where you live in this country, you either ha have access to comprehensive healthcare or you have access to very limited healthcare. Those things really um, influence whether you're gonna have good health or not. Um, I think that Natalie also mentioned gender specific issues. I think that the discrimination that trans people face on a day to day just because of their gender is something that we can't dismiss when we're talking about social determinants of health. When we think of um, programming for trans people, we have the traditional programming. You know, we've had outreach interventions, group interventions, individual community events. But a lot of these um, um, interventions were not really created, developed, or executed by, by trans people. They were developed by cis people. And this, um, although great, and it's you know how we got our foot in the door to have access to, to programming, it's not necessarily been um, the best to have access to the things that people need. Um, the Trans Latina Coalition really was established as a response to that. Um, we traditionally um, saw that programming folks would go to a support group, you know, get food and be able to share space with other trans people, yet they would leave that space and have to go uh, to wherever they were at, perhaps homeless. 
So there was no programming that was really addressing those, again, social determinants of health. And I think when you're asking folks to really think about their health and, and want to really be mindful of having better health, when somebody is homeless and dealing with serious trauma and perhaps um, health is not their priority, they're in survival mode. And that has been an ongoing challenge that we've seen with the community that we serve. So our organization um, is unique because all our programming has developed by trans people from our board to the staff, to our community members, our CAB. We're all part of that development of what are the issues, what are those social determinants of health that are preventing people from being able to live healthy, successful life. Um, so that's what's unique about our organization. Some of the things that we have um, implemented to be able to begin addressing some of those social determinants of health include a drop-in center where people can come, whether they're homeless or they have housing, have a meal every day. Um, we have a place where they can come, use a computer. Um, we have gender specific clothing. Uh, we're able to provide ESL classes, which again, if you don't speak the language can be a tremendous barrier for somebody to be able to secure employment and so on. Um, folks who have been victims of violence, um, we have a comprehensive program that addresses also those issues. Legal services, name changes, um, transitional, uh, in permanent housing, mental health, um, policy and research also. Because as many of you I'm sure know, um, you know, the last four years have been detrimental to trans people when it comes to policy at a national level. We see the efforts now to really prevent children from being able to even compete in sports. All those things affect somebody's health. It affects um, their day-to-day -day life. Um, some of the things that we need to really have as a community is programming that takes these social determinants of health into account as programs are being developed. Uh, we need housing, we need food security, we need um, employment. I think it is important that we start creating programs that addresses um, these uh, social determinants of health. And I would want to invite people that have that are in a position to have, to make decisions with your organization, to start thinking of ways that you can incorporate um, trans people within your organization, whether it's through internships, uh, entry-level positions, to really begin to um, have people reflected within your organization. Um, how will we get, how will we get there, right? Um, we need to eliminate the right tape. We know that for, trans-led organizations, it's very challenging to secure funding because many of them are starting up and don't have the infrastructure. It's imperative that, that funding is allocated for these organizations. Provide equity um, opportunities for trans people within your organization um, and the oppression of marginaliz marginalizations. And true investment in the lives of trans people is a critical step for us to be able to get to a different place. Um, and again, you know, I've, I know trans people that are dear to me that I, that I met through this work that have been at organizations today for the last 20 years, and they're in the same position they were when they started, a health educator, making every year that 3% increase in payment. That is not real investment in trans people. Again, I invite everybody that's watching this video that if you have trans people in your organization, that you look at them as a whole person, that if you have the opportunity to give them leadership positions within your organization, that is the first step that you can take in securing um, the future of trans people by investing in the people um, also within your organization. Uh, that is all, I don't know if I went over time or I'm under time. Again, you can visit us at the translatinacoalition.org. I have put my email and um, phone number. We also have our annual, I would invite you to go to our website, look at our annual report of services for uh, 2020. Um, again, COVID-19 has been a clear um, signal of how much um, there needs to be true investment in trans people. So I thank you for this opportunity and uh, that's all I have.
Thank you. I, thank I, you I, so I, much, Maria. I will stop sharing. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, I definitely want to thank, and I think uh, everyone can agree that um, that was a great presentation, but that also gave us that perspective of trans women that we don't get to hear as much uh, and that we need to keep hearing as much. So thank you not only for the presentation, but also for the plea that you gave at the end. You know, like um, we ask for change, but the change uh, also has to start within our own organizations. So right. I wanted to thank you for that. Um, the next uh, presenter that we have, uh, he's going to be giving us the perspective on uh, men who have sex with men. Uh, this is Dr. Vincent Guillamo Ramos. Uh, before he starts, I also want to keep encouraging people to um, ask questions uh, for our latter part uh, of uh, this webinar. Uh, so without further ado, um, uh, Dr. Vincent, here you go. Well, thank you so much, Frank. Before I start, I just want to say, uh, Natalie and Maria, I loved your presentations. I learned so much and actually, you know, we hadn't coordinated, but what a nice uh, way for me to present having heard both of you. And really, I think you lay out the case of social determinants very nicely. We also want to take a second to thank the Latino Commission on AIDS. And it looks like there's quite a number of participants that are part of our webinar today. So thank you for being here. And a special shout out to Luciano Reverte, who year after year organizes this and I think needs to be recognized for his tremendous work. I'm going to share my screen and hopefully I can add to what Natalie and Maria have shared. And um, I'm going to talk about this from the point of view of MSM. And so there are a couple of things I want to accomplish. Hold on one sec. There we go. We should be able to see that now. Okay. A couple of things. I want to talk about um, the application of the ideas that Maria and Natalie uh, have applied to, you know, cisgender women and also trans people, but I'm going to talk about MSM. And so I first want to kind of highlight that really, when we think about our traditional approaches to public health and to really addressing disparities in HIV and sexually transmitted infections, HCV, or whatever the health outcome is, we tend to focus on the individual. We tend to think about the individual and their behavior, and we see their risk as somehow being endogenous or synonymous with who they are. And so uh, what that means is you might hear people saying, uh, you know, that I, Vincent, as a Latino gay man, that maybe I'm risky, or that I engage in risk behavior. And a lot of the times this decontextualized approach you can see on the left, it results in people being characterized in ways that probably for a lot of us, uh, we might not even realize that that's the underlying message, right? And so they may have what's called a personal problem. It may be deemed as promiscuous. Uh, it may be seen as a risk taker, as engaging in high risk behavior. And that somehow I, as an individual person, as a Latino MSM, that I'm responsible for the outcomes in my life. And so when things don't go well, that somehow uh, it's because of something that I did. What is really uh, you know, quite uh, profound is that the disparities that we see, they're not contextualized in all the things that Natalie and Maria did a beautiful job at really identifying. And so often these social determinants or upstream factors, they really are part of what we see as the context in which risk occurs. And some folks have written and said that there's something called the risk environment, and that in that risk environment, there are multiple levels. I was happy to hear Natalie talk about being a social worker, because this is something that is really fundamental to social work. This idea of kind of the micro level, the meso level, and the macro level. And you can see on the right-hand side that those three levels are really uh, identified. And so I'm going to talk about that and then lay some ideas out, because I think they're really important when we think about uh, Latino MSM, but also when we think about all populations. So let's take a look at the micro level. You can see here that if you're focused on the micro level and you're working with somebody who identifies as a Latino MSM, uh, you might be interested in their sexual and drug behavior. You might think about their decision making and whether or not they're using PrEP, if they're using condoms, are they accessing treatment services? You may think about psychosocial explanations of disparities and talk about things like internalized stigma, their depression, uh, their anxiety, mental health. 
But that, and those things are very important. So I don't want to suggest at all that we shouldn't be thinking about the micro level. But the reason why I've separated these in the slide and why you see meso and macro above in its own box is because there's a tendency to focus extensively and almost exclusively on the micro level. And what we do less of is to focus on the meso and the macro. And here, what you see is that our meso level has to do with how individuals, for our purposes, Latino MSM, are interacting with institutions. And so our health and social service institutions, if they have biases, whether they be reflected in the services that are offered, uh, the way the services are offered, the times the services are offered, uh, whether they be reflected in the policies of those organizations, there can be cultural and linguistic inappropriateness or lack of alignment between the people who are served and the actual services. It can be um, you know, issues regarding sort of employment. And I think Maria gave a great example in terms of salary and opportunity, benefits, and who gets what kinds of benefits. These are all things that are embedded in the institutions. And oftentimes, they're what we call ubiquitous. We don't even realize that there's an unfair thing because we just see it as being that way. Nobody ever gets you know, that particular benefit at this job because nobody gets it. When in fact, that benefit might be something that uh, people actually need and is critical to their health and well being. At the macro level, one step beyond the institution are actually our policies and sort of the national landscape that creates also a context or shapes uh, what we are calling the risk environment. And so here are policies that support one group versus another or support certain uh, issues while not addressing other issues, or uh, in many examples, having policies that actually work against uh, certain communities. Uh, eligibility criteria, who can get it, who doesn't get it. We see good examples in terms of health insurance. Income inequality, there are huge disparities in income in our country, uh, whether people are unemployed or they could be underemployed. They have a job, but they don't have a job that provides them with a career ladder. Also, we often think about uh, you know, HIV or STIs or hepatitis B, A, B, and C as being uh, reflective of individual behavior. But your individual behavior happens in a broader context. And depending upon where you're having sex or where uh, you know, you're uh, engaging or whatever the behavior is that exposes you to HIV, STIs, or hepatitis A, B, or C, um, the community prevalence of those things really matters. And so if you're having sex in a, in a community where HIV is very low or very high, it's going to matter beyond your behavior. You can do the same thing in a different context and have a completely different outcome. And then I think this important concept of leadership, so much of what I heard Natalie and Maria talking about was really about uh, our leadership nationally and our ability to advocate for our community. These factors, uh, they move well beyond the micro level and they start to shape the kinds of outcomes that we see in terms of HIV, STIs, and HCV. Let's take a look at New York State. Uh, we have more than 20,000 Latinx MSM in New York State who were living with HIV in 2018, the most recent data. Approximately one in seven uh, Latinx MSM living with HIV in the US uh, reside in New York State. And you can see here in 2018, more than three in four new diagnoses among Latinx in New York State were among Latino MSM. If you look at new HIV diagnoses across the period 2018 to 2019 among Latinx, you can see that there was an increase in five out of the nine Ryan White regions. And so if you look at our state, you can see that the red areas are highlighted where there have been increases in HIV diagnoses. Uh, and also, uh, you know, some would argue, and that's maybe something that we can talk about during the Q&A, that these diagnoses represent progress because people are being identified as living with HIV and therefore they're able to enter into care. I would argue that many of these diagnoses are among young people who actually their diagnosis represents new infections and that we need to look critically about whether or not this is progress or whether it also is an indicator of additional infections or risk that are not being picked up in terms of our prevention efforts. If you look here, STIs have gone up among uh, Latinx males in New York State. You can see here gonorrhea, primary and secondary syphilis, chlamydia, all increases in New York State. You can see below in terms of MSM uh, at STI clinics, you can see uh, you know, gonorrhea and chlamydia, 
and you can see the site of the infection and the basic patterns that there have been uh, also increases. Really great report from the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine that just came out. I provided the link. It's about STIs in the US. This has been uh, sort of a hidden epidemic. This is the sixth year in a row where we've had increases in STIs, particularly the reportable STIs. And uh, unbeknownst to many people, uh, we have more STIs uh, than ever before in our country. And so this is something that we need to pay attention to and not only address uh, HIV, but thinking about uh, the important role that also STIs has in sexual reproductive health. A little bit about hepatitis. You can see A, B, and C. Those are the colors, the sort of blue, uh, green, and red. You can see the most significant increases in hepatitis C, uh, which typically gets a lot of the attention, but A and B are also very important. We have vaccines for A and B, and yet we still see increases in terms of infections. Latinx uh, with HCV infection are 73% less likely than non-Latinos uh, or non-Latinx to be aware of their status. So even when people are infected with hepatitis C, if they're Latino, they are less likely, significantly less likely to actually know of their infection, which is really quite unfortunate because during that time that they are infected and do not know, they're actually progressing in terms of their viral load, in terms of potential for liver cirrhosis, and some of the other complications, Pep C. Pep C is something that can be treated, and there is, in fact, uh, you know, treatments that will cure people from Pep C that are highly effective. You can see here um, at the bottom right, uh, in terms of Latinos, which is the blue color, in terms of treatment, and then also what we call viral suppression, which is synonymous with effective a cure. Uh, basically, Latinos are less relative to overall African American and white. And you can see that between 2014 and 2018, over 12,500 Latinx uh, people died from uh, hepatitis C. Uh, and so again, uh, disparities. It's not just uh, HIV, STIs, and viral hepatitis. There are broader disparities. And so we tend, because of the kind of work that we do, we tend to focus on sexual reproductive health outcomes. But there are disparities across major morbidity and mortality and you can see in this uh, slide a comparison of the Latino community relative to uh, Latino MSM or sexual minorities versus the heterosexual Latino community. And the dark or the bolded areas where you see the risk, risk ratio, you can see here that cancer, stroke, uh, COPD, uh, also asthma and smoking, that those are elevated in terms of morbidity and mortality relative to uh, for MSM relative to Latinos uh, who identify as heterosexual. I want to give a case example, and the case example has to do with the Bronx, the borough that uh, I've worked in for the past 20 years. I was born in the Bronx. I, I care very deeply about the Bronx. And so there are uh, many well-known disparities in terms of the Bronx uh, relative to the other boroughs in New York City. You can see some of them on the left. Uh, and so again, the Bronx ranks worst among New York City boroughs in terms of self-reported health status, how people report how they're doing in terms of their health, life expectancy and premature uh, mortality, uh, infant mortality, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, and then also psychiatric hospitalizations. You can see the demographics of the Bronx, overwhelmingly Latino, the largest segment of the Bronx population, about 800,000 Latinos living in the Bronx. And you can see that half the Latinos in the Bronx are younger than age 30. And you see the subgroups on the left, Dominican, Puerto Rican, Mexican, Ecuadorian, and then others. So why am I highlighting the Bronx? Because the Bronx really stands out. And so let's just look at the previous year. And a lot of this has gone, I think, uh, you know, unrecognized, but you can see here that from 2018 to 2019, that new HIV diagnoses among Latinx men in the Bronx increased by 20%. What's even more striking is if you look on the sort of bottom, the color codes, the red represents increases, the green represents decreases, and no change. And so there was no change in Staten Island, but in other boroughs of New York City, you see decreases in terms of new HIV diagnoses. But yet in the Bronx, we're seeing a 20% increase. This would suggest that we need to focus on the Bronx. We need to do better for Latinx, uh, and for that matter, other communities uh, besides Latinx MSM, but other Latino communities that are vulnerable for HIV in the Bronx. You can see here the same basic pattern for chlamydia, gonorrhea, and viral hepatitis. 
And um, I'm going to go forward and again, apply a little bit of what I've been sharing about uh, sort of micro, meso, and macro, but apply it to uh, the Bronx and just giving a specific exemplar. So here the Bronx has inadequate rates of common use at last sex. And here I'm focusing particularly on anal sex. Uh, yet, uh, you know, the use of condoms is slightly higher uh, than any other borough. And yet we see disparities in terms of STIs and HIV. And I just showed you guys a slide that showed that it was 20% uh, higher uh, new HIV diagnoses. And so here we're seeing condom use at last anal sex is higher, and yet we still have more work to do because it's still inadequate, but we're seeing these big disparities within the context of other communities that are having improvements. What's going on? Do the individual factors explain the disparity? Or are there other things that potentially account for the disparity along with uh, individual factors? You can see here HIV testing in the past 12 months, about half uh, you know, are, are reporting that they've had an HIV test, which means the other half have not. You can see the meso factors, having a regular healthcare provider, the Bronx ranks the worst. PrEP to need ratio, the Bronx uh, ranks the worst compared to any other New York City borough. Perceived neighborhood safety and involvement with the criminal justice system. Again, the Bronx ranks the worst compared to other boroughs. And you can see here in terms of macro level factors, primary care and mental health providers per capita. And so the availability of these services for people in the Bronx, despite the need, the Bronx ranks the worst. Unemployment, underemployment, and poverty, the Bronx ranks the worst. And then HIV prevalence being, uh, you know, again, the Bronx ranks the worst. And so how does all this play out and what do we do about it? And so, you know, hopefully I've laid out some ideas that it's not just about individual behavior, that these meso factors and macro factors matter. And the question becomes, how do we start thinking about this so that our programs don't only reflect uh, individual level interventions? And I think that an interesting book that I read recently by Richard Crosby and Raph Clemente, two of our, our leaders in the HIV prevention world, is about structural interventions for HIV prevention. And here they apply these ideas of really trying to identify how can we work with both meso and macro structures to shape also the micro context and ultimately to reduce HIV disparities. And some of the examples they provide, one of them has to do with trying to encourage PrEP uptake and persistence. And so that would be at the micro level. And we need to identify, well, what are the drivers of that uh, sort of behavior? And what are the kinds of factors that will increase PrEP uptake and persistence? And so one example would be, having those services be available uh, linguistically and culturally in alignment with the target population, but not stopping there, which is where we typically stop. We need to move beyond that and think about how do we address the meso level intervention approaches? What kinds of partnerships do we need with Latinx MSM community-based organizations? How do we deal with implicit bias in the institutions, in the actual policies of those institutions, the service delivery models? How do we think more broadly at the macro level at how do we ensure that Latino MSM have insurance coverage, that there is actually programs that encourage Latino MSM to not only be uh, recipients of care, but to actually play leadership roles, much of what Maria was talking about in terms of trans populations, encourage uh, Latino MSM to encourage to pursue uh, health careers. And how do we then uh, use our interventions at the meso and macro level to shape uh, you know, the need of whether or not we need to mobilize our communities? How do we evaluate what we're doing, not just at the individual level, but in terms of meso and macro, and to disseminate these interventions in ways that move beyond just our programmatic efforts at the micro level? I want to wrap up by simply uh, saying that uh, I'm very excited uh, to have had the opportunity to present some ideas. I am uh, going to be leaving New York in about a month and I'm, I'm moving to North Carolina uh, to become the Dean of the Duke University School of Nursing. And one of the things that I'm happy about is that I'm moving the Center for Latino Adolescent and Family Health to Duke. And we are fortunate at CLAP to have some uh, new funding from Vive. And one of the things that we're gonna be doing is actually developing a leadership institute that will be national in uh, scope and it will be an opportunity to take what an institution like Duke can do uh, and really try to train uh, Latino experts around the country to respond to the HIV 
uh, AIDS epidemic uh, for Latinos specifically. And you can see here on the slide that we'll have a number of cohorts. We're going to really try to empower uh, you know, community-based organizations and individuals uh, with technical knowledge regarding epidemiology, regarding ways to intervene, not just at the micro level, but at the meso and also the macro level. We're going to try to develop leadership skills, and we're going to create uh, positive networks of leaders around the country that will help advance our common uh, goal of, of really trying to provide better care to our community. Um, some resources from CLAF, we've written a couple of papers. This was done in collaboration with national partners, including the Latino Commission on AIDS. I would check out this article in the American Journal of Public Health uh, around the invisible HIV epidemic among Latinos. Uh, it's not just MSM focus, it's a Latino community as a whole, but it really speaks to some of the points that Natalie and Maria were also highlighting. A free webinar about service delivery and cultural competence, and then also a video that's publicly available at the crisis among Hispanic Latinos, uh, the HIV crisis in the US that really highlights some of the ideas that we've been talking about today. Thank you very much. That's my contact information. That email will work indefinitely because I was a student at NYU years ago. <laughs> keep my email. Uh, but I am really happy to have had the opportunity to talk today. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Vincent. I think, I think we can all agree that you provided us yet another uh, great perspective. And I think we can also agree that um, social determinants of health there are many intersectionalities, but there are also some specific ones that are you know, specific to certain populations. Uh, and I want to thank all of you for providing all the perspectives that you were able to provide. Um, we have a little less than 10 minutes, so I want to get to, to some of the questions uh, that uh, our participants have. Uh, the first one is going to be for uh, Natalie. And it says, uh, it's from Freddy de la Paz. Uh, thank you, Natalie, I appreciate your presentation. I wanted to ask how governmental structures and leaderships may change current systems so that migrating peoples, such as women who tend to find themselves working in dangerous fields so that they can establish themselves in this country in a safe and healthy environment. Yeah, I think, um, so I, First, thank you for the question. Um, well, I think this all leads back to immigration and immigration policies because the biggest fear is around immigration. And I think immigration also creates an, a huge, tremendous barrier for a work. Um, you know, one of the things I didn't uh, talk about, but it was in my diagram uh, that we meet many professional women that have tremendous skills that can contribute even to the organization and to just society in general, but we can't hire them. You know, we can't hire them. And um, that's, that's, that's a big shame. Uh, they're working in these other type of jobs that are really putting them in, you know, really risking their overall health. Uh, and I think, um, again, I just keep saying, I think COVID just highlighted it even more. But I also think that uh, we need to really look at what our elected officials are doing or how much they actually know about what's going on in their areas. Um, I think we have the boots on the ground where we actually hear, we actually see, we hear from our client. We, we, when we do outreach, we go into these places, we see what's going on. We have focus groups in the bar bathrooms if we have to. You know, we, we're the ones help who have that clear reality of what our community is, is going through and what they're living. But I don't think that we're, we always have the ear of those in power, um, those that could take this information back. Um, so, you know, I'm not one to kind to be in that uh, political arena or anything. Uh, I am one to be on the, you know, boots on the ground, but I think there needs to be a lot more work done in terms of who we vote in, who will be, who will be voted in, but also has the boots on the ground, you know, working closely with us, uh, so that, because I think there's a lot of, um, a lot that they're missing that they don't know. And it's up to us, I think, our community-based agencies to make them know, to make them hear, to highlight what's going on. And again, I think COVID is giving us an, a, a, you know, a, a, an opportunity to do that. But it's not, it's nothing new. You know, you know, we we've been going through so 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 many things that COVID highlighted. We've been living for many many years. So um, and it's just being highlighted right now. 
So I just think it definitely all leads to immigration and the people in power and knowing who we're bringing in. Thank you, thank you, Natalie. I think I think we can all agree and definitely resonate with, it resonates with us. Um, the other question that we have from the chat, and um, we have a little less than five minutes. Uh, so I definitely want to ask for a little bit of a, of a concise answer, Maria, but um, why do you think the access for trans persons is so different in different areas, asks um, Don Trotter. Like I live in Buffalo, New York, where we have services that I think are really good, but I'm sure there are so many areas we can do much better. I wonder why it's so different everywhere, because there are cities that there's no services for trans people. You know, I think, unfortunately, a lot of the access um, when it comes to healthcare, it's all really kind of state based. And we have many states that we know that are not necessarily um, very progressive and um, at par with large states like California, where we in California have access to, you know, uh, gender affirming surgeries under our healthcare. Um, and you know, so there has to be a lot of work done at a local state level to be able to really influence uh, the expansion of healthcare access for trans people. Um, you know, unfortunately, that's the current situation when it comes to even changing your name. In California, you can change your name into gender marker, but you go to another state and, and it's all really about the local politics and and, the, and who's in power within the state. Um, and I think that, you know, the, the next frontier is to continue to do policy work at a state level, local city, state, to be able to really uh, expand. I hope that in the future we'll have federal specific protections that will give access to everybody. But we, we know even with Obamacare, there are specific states that did not expand healthcare benefits. And so that continues to be the challenge. I hope I answered that. <laughs> no, 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 of course. I think it was a great answer. Thank you, Maria. Um, and I think just the last question, uh, and this one is going to be uh, for Dr. Vincent. And by the way, Dr. Vincent, congratulations on uh, the new position. Uh, <laughs> but uh, one of the questions that we had on the, on the chat is, is it possible to view the increases in CT, GC, et cetera, as a reflection of more testing and identification or, or are rates of STIs just increasing? What is, what is your opinion? Sure. So I see, Frank, that there are actually two questions that are sort of related to the next one, too. So I'm going to answer both. Is there a correlation uh, between PrEP and also increases in STIs? So I think uh, the way I'll answer that is that certainly testing, increased testing would result in more sort of diagnoses, but many of the populations that are, have the burden of uh, increased uh, STIs are not necessarily the populations that are being targeted for increased efforts. And so the second question, for example, PrEP, about 90% of Latinos that have PrEP indications are currently not receiving PrEP, only about 10% are. So we would be untrue to say that the increases that we see in STI burden, gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, are explained by PrEP because they're not getting the PrEP. And, and also, if we think about something like congenital syphilis, we have pretty much eradicated or pretty much controlled and eliminated congenital syphilis among women who are pregnant and passing syphilis to their child during birth. Uh, but we're seeing that again, and we're seeing that in the Latino community in certain areas. And so something is going on. The increases are not just about testing, but they actually have to do uh, with more STI burden, particularly among certain groups. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Vincent. I think that that also again, like, sort of encompasses all, uh, not only one question but two questions. Uh, uh, before we end, I definitely want to thank each and every single one of you, not only for being here but for the work that you do, Natalie, Maria, Dr. Vincent, uh, and I also want to thank uh, the interpreters that <laughs> were doing a fantastic job today, and the participants uh, for joining us. Um, Thank you so much. Uh, I hope uh, all of the participants uh, join us today for the second round of educational workshops, which is going to be starting at 2.30.
and we are going to be talking about the national community response to COVID-19. Uh, so until then, I will see you. Thank you, everyone.